we lose a little steam. I think we're losing a little steam. We've been here for a couple hours or an hour or something like that. Okay, so let's try it again. Good morning, everyone. There we go, there we go. Now, I'm gonna try to bring together a lot of what Spencer brought up this morning. He's a fantastic speaker, tremendous insights, and some of the things that uh, we've heard so far this morning. And, you know, I, I love this conference. In fact, this is one of my favorite events of the year. And, I, you know, I get to walk away and say, you know what, I'm a best ever speaker. And I'm a best ever economist, which is awesome. Uh, so I'm looking forward to that. But I do want to start with a question to all of you. And I wanted you to raise your hands. How many of you in the room bought an investment property last year? I see your hands? That's a lot of people. That's pretty, that's pretty cool. How many of you plan to buy a property in the coming year, in 2022? Wow, it's just about everybody in here. How many of you plan to sell a property in the coming year? All right, about a third. And that's gonna be an issue. Everybody who just raised your hand, I think our sales manager from our Denver office is here. He'll be happy to meet with you. But no, it actually brings up a major issue because I asked who wants to buy a property, everybody raised their hand. I said, who wants to sell a property? A third of you raised your hands. That's going to be a big thing for our business next year and that's gonna actually show up in our debate this afternoon and I'm gonna bring that up again. So here we go, I have five things that I'm tracking that I think are really going to be significant factors in commercial real estate and the economy in 2022. So I'm gonna go, oh, did it go? Here we go. So I have five trends that I'm watching very closely. I'm gonna give them to you real quick. Number one, coronavirus and the pandemic. Absolutely a key ingredient to shape investment. We see these numbers moving around. It's going to be a factor continuing through the coming year. The labor shortage, this has come up a couple times today. It's driving labor costs, is creating some challenges in terms of our economic growth and in terms of what's happening with commercial real estate as we know it. We also have the supply chain issues. And we all know how that's affecting inflation and our ability to buy what we're looking for at any given day. Uh, you know, sometimes you go and, and try to purchase something and it's simply out of stock and it will be back in stock sometime when a ship lands in Long Beach and they get it off of there. We also have what's happening with interest rates in response to inflation. That's going to have a major effect on all of the people in this room. And finally, we have changing uh, demographics, the aging and maturing of the millennial generation, uh, and that will have, is already having a huge impact on all types of commercial real estate, and it will become even more prevalent as we go forward. So I'm going to dive into each of these items, and then I'm going to pull it together, I'm going to talk about what it means for six different types of commercial real estate, and how it all fits together. So first, what's happening with the pandemic? You can see we had the, del uh, the alpha cycle, the delta cycle, the Omicron cycle. We had this huge surge at the end of the year, end of last year, peaked out. We were hitting around 250 cases per 100,000 people per day. It was off the charts. We're back down to about 35 cases per day out of every 100,000 people, so it's come way back down. Now, the really good news very recently, California announced they're going to be uh, rolling back their mask mandates. They're reducing the, the restrictions there. We're seeing the same thing in New York. We're seeing the same thing in Chicago. We're seeing the same thing in Oregon and Washington. They're following in the tracks of the rest of the country to reduce the restrictions on uh, mobility and allowing businesses to get fully back into operation. That's going to be good. Hopefully, I've seen a new word out there, endemic. Hopefully this does hit endemic, where the 65% of the population that's vaccinated holds up, 
and those who aren't vaccinated may have already had the virus, so they have some other type of immunity, uh, getting us to 75% resistant, and hopefully that's enough to carry us through and we can get out of this thing because I'm getting tired of it. I travel around the country, I go to conferences, I've, I've gone to about uh, 20 conferences in the last six months where I've been speaking. And as I travel around the country, it's different in every city, it's completely different. I'll walk into a room like this, uh, what do we have, half a dozen masks in the room. I've gone to cities where everybody in the room is wearing a mask. I've gone in places where there's not a single one to be found. It is very, very different, it's very localized. And as we go forward, as the mask mandates are reduced, as the vaccines take hold, as we get our booster shots and so on, it allows us to get back to business, that allows us to improve the economy and grow again. So that's the big, first big one. Next one, employment. We lost 22 and a half million jobs as we went into the pandemic. That was horrific. I mean, today we have a hard time remembering, gosh, you know what? A couple years ago, we had the worst job losses in the history of our country. We didn't know how deep this was gonna go. We didn't know how bad it was gonna be. We launched waves of stimulus that were unheard of in the history of our country. And now we kind of look back and go, gee, we have a lot of inflation, maybe we overdid it. Well, that's a heck of a lot better than not overdoing it, quite frankly. If we had missed on that, we could have had some real problems. I'm really happy we injected so much money in the economy. It gave us a lift. It's creating problems, but I don't think they're anywhere near as bad is what they would have been if we hadn't done that. So we had more jobs created last year than we ever have in the history of our country. We are on track to fully recover from the pandemic job losses over the course of 2022. But we do have a challenge and that is the labor shortage. And what I did here is I mapped the number of job openings in the United States compared to uh, the number of people who are reporting uh, uh, and requesting unemployment benefits. And you can see there's a huge gap. There's four and a half million more job openings than there are people looking for work. That is a major challenge. That slows down our economy, that weighs on growth, and it is the number one problem uh, cited by small businesses as they try to grow and look forward. So that's gonna be a hurdle that we're gonna have to deal with. Uh, a lot of people uh, who are in their 60s, the baby boom generation chose to retire as a result of the pandemic. A lot of people are still staying home to care for other family members or children. And we also have reduced our immigration into the country by about 80% over the last five years, resulting in less immigration of talent and labor. And as a result, we're facing a huge challenge in terms of filling those jobs. And what that's doing is it's pushing wages. Companies are paying more today than they ever had before. Overall wage growth is up about close to 6% at this point. Normally it's about 2.5%. If you look forward, this is probably gonna keep rising. That labor shortage is gonna keep pushing wages. We have construction material costs. Those are up about 17%. That's supply chain issues, that's mining, that's all of those uh, challenges faced by, for, by manufacturing and construction. The price of lumber is almost double what it was before the pandemic. It went up, it went down, it's back up again. The price of steel is about two and a half times what it was before the pandemic. So you can see all of those materials costs are weighing on construction. Now, for real estate investors, quite frankly, that's a good thing right? Less supply means you already own the properties. That means performance rises. So that's not a huge headwind. Producer price index is the cost of materials coming into manufacturing. That's up 10%. And the home prices are up 16% on a year over year basis. And so housing is very expensive compared to where it's been. And I'll get into that a little bit more. But the outcome of all of these things on this slide means inflation is up. Headline inflation is around 7.5%, which is high. They don't like it that high. The Federal Reserve, they want it close to 2%. If you look at the uh, core PCE, which is what the Federal Reserve looks at, uh, that was 4.9 until today. They just came out with a new number. It's now 5.2%. So the key thing here is inflation is on the rise and it's continuing to rise. You look at that curve, that shows no sign that it's topping off and coming back down yet. 
it's still pointed up. And all of those issues I talked about earlier uh, are the drivers, right? So do you think our supply chain's going to get fixed in the next few months? No, it's gonna be with us for a while. That means that inflation's still there. The labor shortage is gonna be with us a while. That's gonna drive inflation. The housing shortage that is causing home prices to rise, that's gonna be with us for a while. So any ideas that we're gonna get inflation under control this year, uh, probably not, in my opinion, going to happen. This is gonna be out there a while. But I do want to point out, as real estate investors, this is not a major issue. As Spencer talked about earlier, real estate does well in inflationary climates, especially multifamily self-storage. I know a lot of you invest in those property types. Those tend to mark to market very quickly and adjust and recalibrate. So inflation is not the enemy of commercial real estate. It causes other problems, but in and of itself, it's not the issue. What it does show up is at the Fed. The Fed says, well, it may not be the problem for real estate, but it is a problem for the economy. And so the Fed is standing there going, well, we're gonna have to do something about this. They've already scaled back quantitative easing, uh, and so that's gonna end up in March. Uh, I believe they will start pushing quantitative tightening, and the reason is that that will help them raise the long-term interest rate, the 10-year treasury rate, they're also announcing that they'll change the uh, short-term interest rates, the overnight rate that they charge, raising it three or more times. I see six, seven, eight rate increases by the Fed as uh, different pundits are talking about that. But remember, they're not going to run short-term interest rates into the long-term interest rates. They've got to keep that gap. That's why I think they're going to use more quantitative tightening at the beginning than they're going to be pushing those short-term rates. But... As we all know, historically, if they push those rates too hard, too fast, they can cause a recession. And they, and they might do that on purpose, quite frankly. They may push it a little hard in order to slow things down. But we don't know about that. Now, they've been pushing. We believe that they will start to push interest rates. We're already seeing them up a little bit. They're at about 2% right now. Uh, a year ago, at Best Ever Conference in 2021, that was the debate. Will interest rates rise? And we gave it two years, so we're only halfway. We're, we're at the halftime show here. But I can say my good friend Neil, who, I was, uh, who was my partner, he pointed something out. When, when has anyone put $5 trillion into the economy and not had a big boom, right? And I carried that forward. I said, hey, you know, as we go in, we're going to see some pretty significant economic growth. And when you see economic growth at that level, supply chains are going to run into problems, and then we're going to get the Fed action somewhere when inflation is between 4 and 5%. As I said earlier, the core PCE, which the Federal Reserve is monitoring, is now at 5.2. They started reeling things in about two months ago when it was just getting into the 4% range. So my, on the other side, we had uh, uh, Hunter and Ryan and... Uh, I'm not, I didn't put their quotes because it didn't make them look good. <laughs> well, we do have another debate today. I get to get out there with Hunter. Uh, my, my partner, Kathy, is going to be joining me as we discuss whether or not 2022 will be the best ever commercial real estate transaction market. That's this afternoon. I'm looking forward to it so I can beat up on Hunter some more. Um, he's a good guy. I love him. Just uh, FYI, uh, here's where interest rates were. Uh, when we had that debate last year, here's where they are now. I'm winning. We're winning. Is Neil here? I haven't seen him yet. We're winning, Neil. Uh, and ironically, I did this slide a week ago. The 10-year Treasury was at 1.97 a week ago. It's actually when I just before I came on stage, I checked it. That's exactly where it was at today. Uh, so we're going to continue to see that push there uh, with, with the interest rates. Uh, I expect that to continue to rise. That means your cost of capital is going to be on the rise. And so you need to factor that into your business as you go forward. Now, I've talked a lot about headwinds, inflation, labor shortages, COVID, all these things that are out there. But I need to point out, I need to reiterate, it's very important. There's close to $6 trillion in dry powder, in cash, in savings accounts, in money market funds. This is $6 trillion more than normal. 
This is, this is huge. That's a lot of money. The entire stimulus package, all that money we put into the economy was $5 trillion. This is $6 trillion, more than normal. You can see that curve. It just shot up. That's money sitting on the sidelines. That's money waiting for the uncertainty to go away. As uncertainty is reduced, as these challenges and questions are uh, abate, we'll see that money coming back in in the form of investment and spending and consumption, and that's going to help the economy grow. Last year, we had 5.7% economic growth. That's enormous. That's one of the strongest years of economic growth in the history of our country. And this year, we're predicting somewhere between 3 and 4% growth, which is fantastic. We've been struggling to get above 3% growth for years. So I talked a lot about the headwinds and the challenges that are out there, but bear in mind that we are going into 2022, which is going to be a fantastic year of growth, and it's going to be a great year for commercial real estate. Now, I'm gonna shift gears a little bit, talk a little bit about uh, the millennials and demographics and what's driving that. Uh, you know, for years, I've had fun getting on stage and making fun of millennials because, you know, they were, you know, camped out on their parents' couches, but quite frankly, they're hitting an important age right now, right? I have Connor here with me today. Connor's on my team, he's 29 years old, and he is right on the cusp, he doesn't know it yet, but he's been dating the same person for a few years. Uh, he's on the cusp of moving on to that next stage. The median age of marriage is 29 years old. I think Connor's 29, huh? Then you buy a house, right? The median age historically was 32. We know that millennials are doing things a little bit slower than in the past. 34 years old, they're buying houses. Look how many millennials are in their 30s, in their mid 30s. And then we look back and say, hey, how come housing is in such a shortage? We're, we're building plenty. In fact, in 2022, multifamily construction is going to hit 400,000 units. That's the most new apartment units built in this country since the 80s. When that other generation, the green one there, the baby boomers were coming of age. But it's not going to be enough. We don't have enough housing. We're in a situation where we have no houses for sale on the market. There's two months of inventory on the market right now. That's driving up home prices, right? Because demand is outstripping supply. We say, oh, well, the builders are gonna add in homes for sale. Yeah, they said, hey, we have lots of homes for sale, but only 10% of them are done, 65% of them are under construction, and 25% of them, quite frankly, don't even exist. They're a floor plan on a piece of paper and a lot, and they say, yeah, it's gonna be right there, it's gonna be beautiful, you'll love it. So there is a huge housing shortage. This is why multifamily, Apartment investments have done so well over the last couple years. This is why we're seeing this surge. I met with the National Association of Home Builders uh, about six months ago. I went up, I met with them, and I had uh, meetings, and uh, I told them, look, build. Build as much as you can over the next five years. That is the span. That is the horizon where we know demand is going to continue to exceed supply. It could change if they actually listen and they build like horrific amounts, then of course we could overdo this, but I don't think they will because land costs, lumber costs, labor costs, everything is working against that. But there is a huge opportunity for growth. You have five years of runway as multifamily investors, uh, single family investors, and then it doesn't fall off a cliff, right? It, it just kind of starts to slow down because that curve, that millennial curve is starting to move into older ages and they're starting to move past the household formation. If you look at the household formation relative to construction of single family plus uh, multifamily, you see that uh, we have been in a supply shortage situation for a little while. Uh, especially in 10, 11, 12, 13, uh, household formation absorbed up all the available stock and now we're down to uh, the, barely anything left. Uh, the household formation forecast there is from Moody's. I think that they, uh, in order to drive me crazy, they keep changing their forecast, but really what they're doing is every time they see new numbers for construction of housing units, they change the household formation forecast to whatever that number is for completions because they know we have a housing shortage. However many units get built is however many households get created. So 
that's kind of the, the core driver there. We have the millennials reshaping. The pandemic has changed things around a lot, but this was a trend already in place. They're moving out of the Northeast. They're moving out of California. They're moving out of the upper Midwest. They're moving south. The growth of the millennial generation is migrating. The ability to work from home has accelerated this. We're seeing it in Florida, Texas, uh, Phoenix, Nevada, uh, Salt Lake City, uh, Colorado, Denver, all generating good results. Uh, Charlotte, North and South Carolina doing very well. That's a migration pattern that is going to stick for the next couple of years. That's going to be where the demand goes. But always watch your supply risk, right? You go to Dallas, fantastic growth in Dallas, but you always have that supply risk hanging over your head. So you gotta watch that balance. You can have a red market here where there's no growth or very little growth in the millennial generation, do very, very well as an investor because there's no construction up there. So you gotta look at both sides of it. The property types I put in the box there, property types that outperform because of what the millennials are doing include uh, multifamily, self-storage, hotels, uh, suburban everything, office, uh, now, we don't forget our, our baby boomers out there. They're moving into the prime age for medical office and seniors housing. Those get a lift because of demographics over the next year. So I'm going to blow through uh, a few slides about the different types of commercial real estate and where I see things going. Uh, here are vacancy rates for six different property types. Apartments, industrial, self-storage, record low vacancy rates. I agree with Spencer. He was saying retail looks great. I agree. You have multi-tenant retail. Everybody thought it got killed. Look at that vacancy rate. It went up. It's back down. It's back down to 6%, right about where it was before the pandemic. You look at single-tenant retail at 4.4% vacancy, looking good. Office is the outlier. That's the one that's still facing challenges. Uh, but if we get to the post-COVID cycle, I think office actually makes a pretty strong comeback, especially in suburban markets in the southern US, southern half of the country. That's where I'd be aiming myself. Uh, when you look here, single tenant, here's a snapshot where we are. At the bottom of each of these slides as I go through the property types, there is the average appreciation since I came to the 2019 Best Ever Conference. I grabbed a lot of these exact same slides from that event uh, a couple of years ago, and actually three years ago, and said, how much have things changed since I was on stage in, in 2019? And so that's that number, that's that appreciation since that event. Now, single tenant net lease is not really structured for appreciation. It's a cash flow investment. It's a safety investment. Uh, so of course, the, inflation, uh, the appreciation hasn't been great, but the fundamentals have been reasonably good. Cap rates between about five and six and a half percent, depending on the credit of the tenant, depending on the location, the terms of the lease, and so on. Uh, a fantastic investment for stability and long-term uh, uh, value and cash flow. Uh, we see a lot of baby boomers going into that property type. Uh, the next one is office. Uh, and office properties, again, cap rates five and a half to eight. A lot depends on the tenant the uh, tenant's credit, the strength of the lease, the length of the lease, uh, where it's located and what the growth dimensions are there. I can say like West Palm Beach is doing great. New York, a little, little challenging. But if you're looking around into Connecticut or, or New Jersey, in those suburban areas, it's holding up better. A lot of those markets across the southern US, Texas, uh, Phoenix doing very well. Um, but Office is an opportunity, but it has more risk and there's a lot more cost going into it. Um, so for those of you uh, willing to brave that, I think that the yield potential is about the highest of any property type, but it is, unless you, unless you really know it or you have a team that really understands it, you gotta be very careful. Next one uh, is multi-tenant retail, looking fantastic. Uh, the outlook is strong. Uh, I believe that's going to be one of the major growth areas. Cap rates five and a half to eight and a half, kind of throw off the upper echelon of that. And it will, um, you know, it really boils down to kind of that five and a half to 7% cap rates for multi-tenant retail, depending on location for, unless you have a, a you could go into the, the weaker properties if you really know retail and you have good relationships with tenants. Uh, but that's uh, where that is. Uh, and if you haven't noticed, if you, as I've been going through, the bottom line there 
Each one is successively higher yield compared to when I spoke in 2019. Uh, average appreciation for multifamily up almost 21%. If you had bought in 2019, you're about 21% ahead of where you were back then uh, on average in the United States. Multifamily, record low, vacancy rates, uh, rent growth, uh, double digits, right around 14, 15%. Uh, and it is continuing to grow. Nice runway over the next five years. Self-storage. This was a surprise. I was talking to the self-storage investors at the beginning of COVID. They were deathly afraid. They were worried. It crushed it. Outperformed just about everything else out there over the last couple of years. Cap rates now in the four to, what, four to six percent, this says 7.1, that's backwards looking, really four to six percent range. I'm seeing self-storage deals go into the three, uh, three cap range, which is just mind-boggling, but it, it does make sense. All-time low vacancy rates in that sector, rent growth far surpassing anything anybody expected. Uh, if you bought uh, self-storage property in 2019, uh, you'd be up 23 percent, and the one that has appreciated the most, 52% growth industrial. This is supply chain logistics. Uh, this is e-commerce, which has been driving that. That is reshoring and increasing inventories because you can't rely on things being shipped in from overseas. Uh, I agree with Spencer earlier. He was saying that, hey, you know, you, if you're industrial, you gotta watch it a little bit. There's, there's some things that are slowing this down. Uh, so that is uh, the one that's outperformed everything over the last two years or three years. I have this chart and I'll be happy to make these slides available to you. As I mentioned, uh, Adam Lewis, our man sales manager is here somewhere in the audience. Uh, he'll be happy to send them to you. I'll send them to you. Uh, you can email me, connect to me on LinkedIn. Uh, or just go on my website. We have a lot of new research that we've just released, our 2022 forecast uh, for multifamily was just released. We have retail and office outlook books uh, on the printing press, literally printing right now. We have self-storage as well as hotel uh, outlook on uh, just submitted to the printer. So these will all be coming out in the next few weeks. Uh, they're available on our website. Uh, you'll be able to find them there. And as I wrap up here, I want to share the last few things. The outlook is positive. Things are looking very, very good. That's going to support demand for all types of commercial real estate. Demographics are key. You want to watch, you want to watch those. those are, you want to monitor those demographics, where they're going, where they're moving. That drives the, the, the waves that impact commercial real estate in, uh, the most, far beyond anything else. Uh, the supply chain labor issues, uh, those are going to be short-term risk. We'll get over those hurdles over time. Inflation is a big thing in the news. Don't worry about it as real estate investors, other than the fact that it's going to cause interest rates to rise and your cost of capital to rise. Uh, and it's going to get bumpy. You know, we have tremendous big issues in the news every day. My heart goes out to the people in Ukraine and everything happening there. As Spencer said, there's a humanitarian side, there's a commercial real estate investing side, very little effect on our business. Uh, but just remember, 2022, we're gonna see all sorts of things in the news, but fundamentally, the market is sound, the economy is good, and the outlook is bright. You're in the right room. I thank you for sharing this time with me, and I will be available for questions out here in the other room uh, after this, so thank you.